Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, all things war and peace, we're speaking with our guest, Danny Shorson, who is a retired U.S. Army officer, director of the new Eisenhower Media Network, EMN, senior fellow at the Center for International Policy, and a contributing editor at Antiwar.com. His work has appeared in the LA Times, New York Times, The Nation, HuffPost, The Hill, Salon, BuzzFeed, Tom Dispatch, TruthDig, among other publications, and he hosts the Fortress on a Hill podcast, and his website is at SkepticalVet.com. Danny Shorson, welcome to Talk World Radio. Oh, thanks for having me. Glad to do it. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for everything you're doing. I know we won't be able to talk about every current war and military boondoggle in 28 minutes, but uh, maybe we could start with one you've been writing about uh, recently, and I, almost nobody else is, uh, and that's Somalia. Uh, apparently, it's just sort of uh, not that big a deal that the United States is sending missiles into Somalia, is it? Well, it's not a big deal to most of the American people. I mean, that's one. Somalia is one of the the oldest of the GWAT, right? Global War on Terrorism, as they call it, campaigns. It's also been one of the quietest ones. Um, only two American soldiers or service members have been killed in Somalia. I believe it was one Navy SEAL and one Green Beret. Uh, of course, there was another American soldier and two contractors killed in Kenya in January of 2020. Let me say that again. In Kenya, American service members and contractors have been killed. Uh, this would have been sort of unheard of to a certain extent in the 1990s. I mean, in the United States military wasn't particularly involved in sub-Saharan Africa, except for our earlier ill-fated Black Hawk Down incident, right, in 1993. I think that's the interesting thing about the campaign in Somalia. Uh, since 2001, U.S. Special Forces, airstrikes, drones, proxies, hired mercenaries, some of whom are from South Africa, former apartheid soldiers, that's fun, uh, have been engaged in a campaign against a variety of what we would call Islamist jihadis, you know, the names are always changing, um, that have morphed, you know, in fact, they've become more radical and more powerful the more America throws fuel on the fire. Uh, so, you know, it's like bomb, bomb one Islamist in Somalia and create three. It's that uh, counterproductive coin math, you know, counterinsurgency math that we used to joke about in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, but most Americans, if they hear about American fighting in Somalia, they think back to the movie Black Hawk Down. It's like the clock stops on the morning of October 4th, yeah. you know, after the big battle on October 3rd, the Black Hawk Down incident, you know, when our humanitarian intervention, which had morphed into a kind of counter militia intervention, not tied to the war on terror, right? This is before 9-11. Um, we get ourselves involved as just another militia in a civil war full of militias. And now, oh, we just happen to wear a really fancy uniform. We don't chew cot, you know, we don't chew the uh, narcotic. That's the only thing that was different about our militia. We get ourselves involved in the fight. And that was a big story because there was that book by Mark Bowden written about it. And then there's the famous movie that they showed us as freshmen at West Point. I'm not sure what the, they, they never gave us any context. They didn't tell us why we were there or why the mission failed or why that might've happened. But uh, they, they showed it to us, I guess it's like a leadership uh, lesson. <laughs> and uh, maybe for platoon leaders, certainly not for policymakers or generals, because they, they failed miserably. But what's happened in Somalia is that we've kind of ramped up and down our bombing and our overt kind of interventionism uh, throughout the last basically 19 years, all of which has occurred under the radar. Um, most recently, the story was that Trump pulled about 500 soldiers out of Somalia. Uh, and this was right at the tail end, right at the tail end of his administration. And the, the thing about it is it was fascinating because I don't think most people realized that there were 500 American troops uh, in Somalia at the end of 2020. That should have been the story. The story should have been, isn't it weird that we have 500 soldiers in Somalia and no one knew much about it? Instead, the story was because Trump was president. Uh, and I'm not like a Trump guy, but I think he's his, his, what he did to the establishment is fascinating. So... Uh, because Trump was president, the story, if you actually read the few articles that came out of like the Washington Post and New York Times, was this. He can't pull out of Somalia. The, the terrorists are going to come for your kids if he does that. It's like, but guys, congressmen, media, you didn't even really know how many troops we had in Somalia. You can't give me the rundown of even the basics, the high points of what we've done in Somalia since 2001. Yet because Trump's pulling them out, you're upset. 
Um, and then recently it's back in the news because Biden bombed uh, the Al-Shabaab, the latest sort of strongest Islamist group in Somalia, bombed them two times, I believe, in the last two weeks, which was the first times that he, uh, that he approved bombing in Somalia. Trump had, despite pulling the troops out at the end of his tenure, ramped up the bombing there to record levels in 2019 and 2020. I've written a little bit about that, um, especially at the tail end of his administration. So that's where we sit now. And the question becomes, will ground forces kind of get back into Somalia? Right now, they're advising them via Skype and email. Um, I have I don't even think that Zooming like this is the best way to teach a class at, when I guess teach at USC, let alone advising a counterinsurgency effort by off the rails war criminal soldiers that we raised and trained, I think that's pretty tough. So the Pentagon has uh, leaked some stuff, some of these insiders saying that they want to get back into Somalia. And I guess the question is whether Biden will take the next step. So, you know, pull out of one war in Afghanistan, kind of, sort of, maybe, uh, and maybe just ramp up slowly a quiet war that won't get a lot of media attention. That seems the new formula, the new American way of war, abstract and invisible. Yeah, it's, you know, you say that the American people don't care about the missiles going into Somalia, but the, the media doesn't tell them to. It's not all over the front pages. It's not on their TV. Nobody's uh, raising hell about it. It's just sort of, uh, you know, a little paragraph on page 17. And why should they care? Uh, and, and it seems in the U.S. media and even in U.S. law under the War Powers Resolution, unless there are U.S. troops on the ground, it's not a war. It's not even hostilities, right? This new war powers bill from Senator Murphy and others would redefine hostilities to include bombing a place, even if U.S. troops aren't on the ground, which seems kind of hostile. It seems like it ought to be hostilities. Uh, but how do you, uh, you know, how do you get people to care, uh, you know, if, if there are not lives that matter? on the ground. Uh, and if Biden wants to send U.S. troops into Somalia, then how do we take advantage of that to get people to care? Um, it's, you know, it seems like a, a media problem. Well, it's it's definitely that. I mean, it, it's a media problem because the media is complicit in continuing these wars because so long as they don't report on them. I don't know about you, but I heard that the the self-styled goal of the media, what they're self-righteous about is that they're like the fourth estate, right? They keep, they hold us accountable, right? They watch the Pentagon, they watch the policymakers. In fact, they would argue, I mean, these people, have you ever actually talked to people who are like serious establishment media? They really believe, put three beers in them and they'll tell you self-righteously that they are like more important than Congress, except that's not what they do anymore. Right. They're, they're, they're corporate partisan entities that will accept anything the CIA leaks them if it benefits them politically. But in terms of actually looking at what we're doing in the world, you know, why does the intercept, you know, for whatever you think of the intercept, why does the intercept have to leak the document of, you know, the 29 bases the Pentagon didn't want you to know about that we have in Africa? Right. Why is Nick Terse writing about Africa? And like no, nobody else. There's like seven of us who write about Africa. I mean, I realize how that sounds, but it's, it's a true thing. I mean, really, really write about it. Not, not take uh, an AP report, you know, or a Reuters, you know, paragraph report and then sort of like make your own and just plagiarize it and add a few fluff words. I'm talking real analysis, context, backstory, contrast. None of that really goes on. And so Africa to me, and, and Somalia is just like one of the strongest playing grounds, right? It's kind of the, the linchpin on the horn of Africa. And then the Sahil, it's like Mali, Chad, Burkina Faso. That's like the other linchpin. And there's this belt in the Sahil where the U.S. is wildly active ever since 2002, ramped it up. Most of that goes unreported. I think there's a few reasons for it. Americans don't die there in vast numbers. They don't, right? There was those four... Uh, Green Berets who were killed in Niger in 2017. That's like my favorite incident in the global war on terror. I realized how that sounds. I didn't want those people there or to die. But what was fascinating about it was watching the establishment politicians and media spin. Because the truth is, they didn't know. They didn't know that our Green Berets were in active combat in Niger. Not only that, they didn't know how to pronounce Niger. And I don't know if you've ever seen it spelled, but a mispronunciation gets awkward and fast, right? But they can't pronounce it, let alone find it on a map. My quirky four-year-old son is more likely to find it on a map, but that's because he's a weirdo like his dad. But the media doesn't report on it, therefore it's not a story. I think it's because not a lot of American soldiers die. 
because the government doesn't want you to know what they're doing. Recently in 2017, the Pentagon took this new step, right? A big secrecy middle finger at democracy, at a cowardly Congress and a compliant citizenry saying what? Saying, we no longer have to tell you how much money we spend on OCO, OCO, Overseas Contingency Operations. Talk about a bureaucratic, bland, you know, sort of euphemism that's meant to hide, right? It's meant, it's meant to dissemble. So we don't have to tell you how much we spend on it, and we don't even have to tell you the exact troop counts or where they are. Yeah. You are no longer allowed to know that. And not just, not just you, but most congressmen don't have the proper classification. And so this is what I would call a formula for forever war, a formula for a forever war where you can bomb Somalia at record rates under the Trump administration. You can re-infuse the bombing campaign under Biden. You can even have U.S. troops in nearby Kenya uh, doing operations cross border because the Al-Shabaab insurgency has flooded over into the Northern Kenyan border where a lot of ethnic Somalis live. All that can happen. And every time an American is killed there, which doesn't happen a lot, but that's the only time it really jumps in the news. Every time an American is killed there, I actually enjoy, because I love absurdism a bit, I enjoy watching the media and the Congress pretend they knew they were there in the first place. And not and, and kind of feign surprise, but also not really. And so I think that what you're raising here is important. The media is not only complicit, but they help foster the formula that allows American operations to go on for 19 years, unquestioned, uncritically accepted by the citizenry, but of course, also by the media. And and everything re-forgotten year after year, not just how to pronounce Niger, which they knew when they did the yellow cake uranium lies, right? They knew, and now they've forgotten. But the, the you started out with how counterproductive this is, and they know it. They know that where you build the U.S. bases, where you put the U.S. troops, where you do the counterterrorism, you get more terrorism. They know it's counterproductive. Uh, why? Why does it keep going on? And clearly, the motivations cannot be the stated motivations. You know, there's a lot of debate about this, like in the anti-war communities or the military reform communities. Like, why, why do it? Um, you know, some people are straight up economic determinists. And I am not precisely that, but I do put a lot of stock in it. OK, so kind of, at, you know, Africa is a great little playground, petri dish. Uh, and sort of proving ground for this new American way of war, which, of course, fuels enormous profits for the military industrial complex, because not only does the military industrial complex get to, you know, sell the drones and the different equipment to this, the relatively small. I mean, it's enormous compared in 2001. There were 46 U.S. Army soldiers in sub-Saharan Africa, 46, 40, 46. There's uh, anywhere between 6,000 and 6,500 American troops that we know about. OK, then and mostly through leaks in, in Africa on any given day. So that's an increase of what a thousand percent or so. Right. Lots of contractors. And, and, and so that and that's not the contract. That's the uniform people. Then there's the contractors. But the, the, the military industrial complex makes a lot of money in Africa because they sell to all our proxies. Right. They sell to the mercenary contracts, but they sell to the local governments. Oh, by the way, uh, these local governments that we work with are wildly corrupt and illegitimate. Wildly corrupt and illegitimate. How do we know that? There have been eight military coups, successful ones, in sub-Saharan Africa that were in Africa that have been perpetrated by U.S. trained military officers. I'll say that again. Eight times since the founding of AFRICOM in 2007, a U.S. trained military officer has overthrown the at least vaguely democratically elected government of an African country that we continued working in afterwards. And so that's the counterproductive. So that's one reason we do it, I think, is the money. The other one, and this is big, this is big in Africa right now. Okay, in 2018, the National Defense Strategy, the NDS, the big document that's put out of what we're for, we meaning the military, what I used to be a part of, what we're for. Well, until 2018, top priority, we love priorities, we particularly like lists of three or five, but the top priority in the military was listed, this comes from the top, this is the President and the Secretary of Defense, was basically counterterrorism. In 2018, for the first time, that shifted to something called GPC. Has to have an acronym, preferably with three letters. Great power competition, right? Great power competition. That means Russia and that means China. So AFRICOM is like, wait a second, we're a backwater. And everybody wants relevancy because relevancy in the military means more money for your branch or your command. When they hear, when AFRICOM, the newest, the baby command, with the, it's, it's got a chip on its shoulder, right, in the schoolyard. All right, it's got like the Napoleon Cup, it's got the least troops, it's the newest one. 
It's the least kind of known by the public. They're afraid they're not going to get that much money. Their pie is going to be smaller. Uh, where's the action going to be if the focus now is GPC? When it was terrorism, they could say, look, everybody who praised Islam more than they ought is an enemy. You know, and I'm exaggerating a little, but basically they, they could brand anyone an Islamist, even if it's an ethnic militia that just happens to like use some Islamist language. So they could be relevant under the counterterror being the focus. All right. But now it's like Russia, China, uh, that's going to be UCOM, right? That's going to be, the, you know, the European combatant command. That's going to be for Russia and it's going to be PACCOM the Pacific Command, but what about AFRICOM? So here's what they started doing. Instead of finding an Islamist behind every bush, scrub, and jungle, right? Now they find Russian and Chinese influence. And it's not hard to do because it is there, but you show me a part of the planet where it's not. So they'll say Russia is sending lots of mercenaries, right? Lots of mercenaries to Africa, see, like the Wagner Group. First of all, they are to some extent, uh, but they got their butts beat uh, in parts of Libya and really badly in Mozambique, where they got run out of town after taking massive casualties in an ambush in the forest. But we've got like 28 different contracting organizations working for the Pentagon in Africa. That never gets mentioned in the New York Times articles when they write like bad boy stories about Wagner. Now, China's throwing a lot of money in. China's like the number one investor in Africa, direct investment. But, the, but China doesn't do it with guns. They don't do it with their military. They don't send troops. They let us do that. They're like, yeah, let's let them spin their wheels and create more terrorists and bog themselves down. What we'll do is we'll invest and we'll take this belt and road infrastructure thing. And we'll say it's going to go all the way down and make like a southern loop through Africa, like to get around the traffic in Chicago. But they're doing it smart with money. And, and they win influence that way, whereas we kind of spin our wheels, like I said, with the military. Now, we'll I'll be alarmist. The You know, AFRICOM says, oh, China got it another military base in Africa. Look, they have one military base in Africa in Djibouti, and I think they're about to open one more. Russia has like one and a half, kind of. Well, we know we have 29 what we call enduring and non-enduring bases. What the, what the hell does that even mean, enduring? It's just a way of saying, well, really, we only have 14 that are enduring. Enduring, what does that mean? It's there forever. It's, it's, they, they, just, they twist the language. The bureaucratic linguistic gymnastics is unbelievable. But anyway, in 2019, in response to that 2018 move of a military priority from counterterror to GPC, great power competition, AFRICOM does a study group. We love study groups in the military too. We're gonna relook at our priorities. So in 2020, they released their new campaign plan, right? Their new lines of effort. And wouldn't you know that they quote, aligned their priorities, which had been all counterterror. That's why we needed troops in Africa, right? Because we never had them, right? We only have 46 in 2001, suddenly we needed them. They realign their part is to be GPC. So now they see a Chinese businessman or a Russian mercenary behind every tree, scrub, and desert mountain, just like they used to see Islamists. So they find ways to exist. And so I think that that's the main thing. It's, it's money and it's geopolitics, and it's just this bureaucratic wrangling. This is a generation of generals that doesn't know what it is to be at peace, doesn't particularly want to be. The war on terror made their career and they don't have any other answers for us. These aren't a creative sort for the most part. They're not, they're not thinking outside the box despite using that silly phrase constantly. They don't do it, they just say it. So I think this is a really important point. And it's, uh, I'm afraid Africa is gonna be the playground for Biden just like it was for Obama. Low casualties, high payoff, they think. Plus who doesn't have a base in Djibouti? I mean, it's, it's like a bazaar of, of national military bases. Like who doesn't invest in bioweapons labs in China? I, I mean, on top of China and Russia spending a tiny fraction of what the United States does on militarism to begin with. I mean, how credible is it that these are real enemies that are going to come and get you and take away your freedoms? It, it's, uh, the laughableness of it seems to me to have something to do with how much we're hearing about UFOs lately. I, I mean, are they, is there really a credible enemy out there? I'm more scared of UFOs than <laughs> Chinese businessmen in, in Africa. Yeah. I, I, I want to go on the record with that, okay? So please quote me, everyone, all right? <laughs> I could get canceled. No, uh, seriously, though, this is a farce. The threat alarmism that drives American policy is, I mean, Joseph Heller would write a new Catch-22 about American operations in Africa. It, it, it's really crazy. Um, in their own statement last year, um, the inspector general comes down and does like this enormous report on each of the commands. And I'm, for my sins, I read them page to page, hundreds of pages. And, and uh, they admitted that at the current time, quote, 
no VEOs, let me translate again, <laughs> violent extremist organizations. They could have just said terrorists, right? But anyway, it, v, no VEOs have the capacity to strike the United States in all of Africa. They told the inspector general this, which essentially to me says, we don't need to exist. So we're gonna pack up. Guess what, taxpayers? You like those surpluses, right? You want another check? We're shutting down for business. Nobody can hurt you, right? Of course, they would argue it's because we're here. Like, oh, it's complicated for a lot of reasons. There's actually more VEOs than there ever were since we went there. But nevertheless, uh, the truth is that there is there is no major threat in Africa. And um, in terms of that economics, let me just put one quick stat out there um, or, or fact. It is no accident, I would argue, and I can't prove this, right? I haven't seen the smoking gun document. But I would argue that it is no accident that AFRICOM is formed. The genesis for it begins in 2006. They start talking about it. That's the first time you'll see media reports that the Bush administration is considering forming a new command for Africa, which was the one continent that wasn't under a proconsul, which is really what it is. And we're the only country that divides the earth into different commands. It's we're, interesting, isn't it? Um, that's when they first start talking about it. 2007 is when it opens for business officially. 2008 is when the headquarters itself actually opens. Wouldn't you know that it was either in 06 or 07 when China surpasses France and the United States as the major, as the top trade partner for Africa, the top trade partner investor. I don't think that's an accident. So I don't think it's all economic determinism, but it's important. So the threat, right, is not a security threat. Uh, there's really no major Islamist organization in Africa that has the capacity and most don't even have the will to, you know, attack Milwaukee. Yeah, there aren't that not many. And the Russians and the Chinese, their operations in Africa are not any sort of existential threat to the United States. The existential threat to the United States to China and Russia pose is that we're provocative enough that one of the sides shoots off a nuclear weapon by accident and the world ends in an afternoon. That's the threat. But it seems to me that if that's the threat, then keep it a little bit away from each other. Not chasing each other around Africa is probably a better way. Yeah, maybe getting rid of the nuclear weapons. Uh, with Danny Sharson what? with- Don't you uh, hate America, obviously? If you say that, you must hate America. Uh, Get rid of nukes? Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> depends. it depends if America is the people who live in the United States or a government that lives in Washington. Uh, right. the, uh, the, the, the thing about these, these troops going into these countries with these dictatorships and these horrible oppressive governments uh, and selling them weapons and training their militaries and funding their militaries in many cases with, with U.S. military money, uh, it, it seems that the, that the weapon sales as well as the bureaucratic interests and the economic competition are, are a big part of it. Uh, what can we do? I know this week, Congresswoman Omar reintroduced her Stop Arming uh, Human Rights Abusers Act. Now, I don't know how you sell deadly weapons to someone and have them not abuse anybody's human rights when they use them. But if you could, if you could put some sort of limit on which governments were sold weapons, which even the Biden administration is pretending to contemplate at the moment. Would that help? Would that, would that be a way to scale back the madness? I think it would. I think that would be a start. It's a good start, too. I mean, I want to talk about criminal complicity. Criminal complicity. I mean, you, you know, we're like the getaway driver, the, the conspirator in the back room. We do all the aiding and abetting possible, even when we don't drop the bomb, right? I mean, we like, we're the country that's in <clears throat> the back alley, so it's not a back alley. It's a major arms fair in like the Javits Center or whatever. Actually, who am I kidding? It's in Texas. But nevertheless, like, or Northern Virginia. I mean, we're, we're like, in, we're, we're really, we're the guy in the back alley who like, sh try, like poorly shaves the serial number off of the weapon that becomes the murder weapon. Then we help them plan it. And sometimes we drive the getaway car or we drive, you know what I mean? Like literally, I mean, we, we will transport these folks places um, and, and we'll teach them how to do it, right? Well, we'll go over the plan with them. I think that the arms component of this is big because when you talk about ethical complicity, you know, forget about the strategic, the tactical and the criminal, you know, the ethical complicity of who you sell arms to is really interesting. Uh, I was reading a report, I think it was the Times or the Post, they're my favorite kind of like, you know, uh, whipping boys because they make it so easy, had a report all about Russian arms sales in Africa. And it lists out, like, I think Russia now has like, uh, it's, it's either 18 or 28, I got a lot of numbers in my head, but it's a lot, right? Russia has military deals like um they have these like uh 
status of forces kind of deals, except they don't have troops there. But they're like military cooperation agreements, that's what they call them, with like 18 African countries now, which is more than they, they used to have, you know. And I read that, and then they listen to how many they sell weapons to. And I was like, oh, it sounds like a lot. But I just have this thing I do where I like context. I really do, and I really like contrast. I think it matters. So then I was like, well, how many do we have? And I knew the number was high, and of course we have more <laughs> in both cases. And, and we've been having way more. And then I thought, well, maybe the New York Times is trying to say that Russia sells to the ugly government, you know, to the messy ones, to the corrupt ones, to the dictatorships. Because it did kind of imply that in the article. And I was like, hmm, wonder how many military coups were fostered by their trainees. And, and of course, if you look at the ledger, and, and, and this is something I'm actually working on for a report, is like a ledger of who Russia has like closer relations with in terms of arms and military sales and cooperation agreements and who America does. Actually, it's, it's, it's pretty similar. In fact, ours is a little worse, um, partly because of volume, but also partly because the governments that, <clears throat> excuse me, that face insurgencies tend to be corrupt governments, which is why an insurgency starts. Yeah. Right. They don't come out of nowhere. It's, you know, the, the, the government is seen as illegitimate or, or not sharing social services or, or being abusive to one ethnic group or another. So then counterinsurgency starts. And we happen to be on the side of the counterinsurgent usually, which tends to be a strong man. So th this, this is ridiculous. But I do think that when you talk about arms deals, not just in Africa, by the way, America should take a hard look at who it sells to. And the only time that we should use an ethical waiver, as I would call it, is if supporting this country is genuinely in the direct national security interest of the United States. And I mean defense of homeland. And if we did that, the arms sales worldwide would collapse worse than the housing market in 08. And that's not going to happen because the military industrial complex fuels the people who could do it, fuels the congressmen, funds the congressmen who have the power to do that. Danny Shorson, with about one minute left, I don't know if you can answer this crazy question, but why wouldn't that requirement eliminate the weapon sales entirely? What would be the, the case where the weapon sales were justified? Frankly, I think you're right. I, I can't think of a lot of countries we really need to be selling weapons to. I mean, Canada? I don't know. I, mean, I guess hold down the northern flank. Um, I don't even think NATO actually, you know, does much and has much purpose anymore, you know, to our national security. I don't, I don't think that Russia is the threat that it is. I think in many cases we kind of, like, prop up other people, make them dependent. I mean, I sound like a libertarian on the, on the market uh, of the arms sales right now, but <clears throat> I think we created dependency. Frankly, I think we shouldn't really be in the arms sale business and then still are, still call ourselves the arsenal of democracy, uh, contradiction in terms. To say that we're the indispensable nation and the greatest force for good in the world, we're the, crazy to say that, maybe selling guns to people isn't the best thing. Maybe that shouldn't be our national industry. We used to make automobiles, I heard. Now we sell guns. I think force for good actually means we're here for good. You can't get rid of us. Uh, but uh, <laughs> that's the most sense I can make out of it. Danny Shorson, uh, time flies by when you're discussing uh, the crimes of the U.S. military. Uh, check out the website, SkepticalVet.com, and the podcast, Fortress on a Hill. Danny Shorson, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Oh, thank you. So glad to do it. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.